Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to another episode of Parallel C++. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about fairness. So there are a number of different things we can optimize for in our parallel applications. So for example, one thing we can optimize for is throughput. So completing the most amount of work items per unit time. Now, while optimizing you know, solely for throughput you know, is what we want in some circumstances, it's not necessarily the only thing to optimize for. So let's take a quick example um, of something like a server that you know, services requests from multiple different users. So if, if we were only optimizing for something like throughput, the best thing to do to process the most amount of work items per unit time might be to only service requests from one user at a time. So for example, our main compute thread might just take requests from some user A, um, and, and that's it, right? Until we run out of requests and then switch to a new user. Now, what this might lead to is, you know, multiple other users, say users B, C, and D, waiting a very long time for their request to be filled. So we have a very high response time now, even though we have very good throughput overall. So there are multiple different things we can optimize for. So what we're going to be talking about today is this idea of fairness and how we can implement fairness in the context of something like a lock. A lock is a, uh, a great example for showing off fairness because we have multiple different threads trying to gain access to say some shared resource here. And we can either do it to maximize throughput, so just give you know whoever requests the lock kind of first the lock, or we can do it to guarantee more fairness and ensure that you know each of our threads aren't waiting too long right, to get access to the shared resource. So let's go ahead and take a look at our example here. So we'll start off by looking at our baseline. So our code is going to be pretty simple. We're really just going to be measuring the amount of time it takes to get the lock, or at least the maximum amount of time that a thread is waiting. So each of our threads, so we're going to spawn eight threads total, is going to be running some loop for two to the 22 iterations. And we're going to be keeping track of the max wait time of each of our threads. So in this first case, we're just going to be using our basic p thread spin lock that we looked at last time here. So this p thread spin lock t. So each of our threads is going to be running the same uh, work function or this lambda here. So for num iterations, uh, all that our thread is really going to be doing is trying to grab this lock here, right? And we're going to you know, see how long it takes to actually grab that lock by taking a start time and a stop time using the std chrono system clock now. So after we you know, get this duration here, so the stop, uh, the stop time and the start time, we'll just unlock our thread. We'll calculate how long um, you know, this duration was in microseconds, and then we'll keep track of the you know, running max. So what was the max amount of time that this thread was waiting here? And then we'll save that out to memory at the very end after we've processed these two to the 22 iterations. So down at the very bottom here, you know, it's pretty simple. We just spawn our work. So we create a vector of threads here. We place back our work and our, our thread ID. That's how we'll know which you know, index of this array to write to, this max wait time. Then we join our threads. We just wait for our threads to complete. And then we'll print out the max wait times. And these will be the max wait times in microseconds here. OK, so that's going to be our baseline. We're just using this p thread spin um, lock t, right? And this p thread spin lock and unlock here. So pretty simple. But if you recall from last time, our spin lock didn't have any mechanisms to ensure fairness. All of our you know, threads really just tries to do this atomic decrement to grab a lock and then fell into this busy waiting loop where they waited for a lock to become free. Then whenever the lock be became free, our threads would just race to grab the lock again. There was no mechanism in place to guarantee that, you know, you know, if a thread had been waiting a long time, it would get the lock next. So let's see how we can implement something like that with a simple ticket spin lock here that I have implemented. So let's go ahead and take a look at this class spin lock here where we have our own custom spin lock. So with a ticket spin lock, um, the core idea is like a ticket serve counter, right? Maybe at uh, something like a market or, or deli or something like that, where the key idea is instead of, you know, everyone trying to rush to the counter and be served first, people, when they go inside, they'll grab a ticket with a number on it. And then there's a now serving uh, number that says, you know, who's next in line or who's going to be served now. So instead of, you know, the lock working on a uh, first come first serve basis, so whoever grab, tries to grab the lock first gets the lock. Instead, um, threads are going to be given the lock in the order that they request the lock, right? So this is how we're going to help guarantee uh, some fairness here. So how exactly do we implement this? So we'll have two pieces of state here inside of our lock. 
we'll have our line and our now serving number. So this is the place in line uh, that you know a thread grabs when they grab our lock. Um, and then this is you know kind of our now serving number. So who currently has the lock? Now our lock method is pretty simple, right? To get a place in line, we're just going to do an atomic fetch and add here, right? So we're going to get the current um, you know place in line, and then we're going to increment line by one atomically, and then we're just going to fall into this you know, waiting loop here. So while the now serving number is not equal to our place in line, we're just going to repeatedly in this loop call pause, right? That same kind of wait instruction that we saw uh, that was being used by our pthread spin lock. And we're doing it through this um, x86 intrinsic here, this mm pause. Then if we want to unlock our thread, so if we did get the lock here, so if serving is equal to our place in line, all we're going to do is increment our now serving number by one. We're going to let the next person in line grab the lock here. So that's all we really need to do uh, to implement something like a simple ticket spin lock. So let's go ahead and you know get down to our example here and we see that it's the exact same thing as last time. The only difference is instead of using a pthread spin lock T, we're just using our own custom spin lock class. So what we're going to be you know, trying out here is you know, we're going to you know, still just be measuring the amount of time it takes to get our ticket spin lock this time, right? So still the same, you know, stop, start, then we unlock our spin lock after we get our duration. We calculate the duration in microseconds, and then we save the max, right? And eventually save the, you know, final max at the very end into our std array. And the spawning of threads is exactly the same as well, right? We just spawn a vector of threads, join them at the very end, and then we print out the max wait times for each of our threads. So let's go ahead and you know, see the results of these two different uh, implementations here, right? Of these two different spin locks. So we'll go ahead and compile first baseline and we'll compile it with O3 optimizations, the C20 standard and linking against libpthread. And then we'll do the exact same thing for our ticket spin lock here with the same optimization flag. So O3 standard C20 linking against libpthread because we're using std thread. Okay, so let's see the differences in the you know, max wait times, right, between these two different implementations. So we'll first run, you know, our baseline case a few different times, you know, and what we see is, you know, a fairly high degree of variability, right, between our different, um, you know, between our different threads here. So, you know, we'll go ahead and run it, you know, two, three times here, maybe four times. And what we end up seeing is, you know, while, you know, this one thread, you know, the max wait time was only 222, or sorry, 229 microseconds, we had some threads waiting for almost 30,000 microseconds here. Some at 20,000, some at 30,000, another at 20, this one at 24,000, and, you know, one at 229. And the same thing for some of the other, other examples. This thread was waiting for 13,000 microseconds, but this one was waiting for almost 52,000 microseconds. So we can have some starvation here because, um, you know, this other spin lock is more optimized for, say, throughput. You know, any thread that tries to grab the lock, right, if it gets the lock first, right, that's great. But other threads can be starved for access to some, you know, critical section here. So let's go ahead and compare that to our ticket spin lock here. With the exact same setup, all we've done is swap out the lock implementation. So let's go ahead and run, you know, one ticket. And what we end up seeing is that, you know, our average wait times or our max wait times between our different, um, you know, threads that we have, you know, they're much more even and they're much closer together here. So in this case, right, you know, almost all of our threads are waiting for around 17,000 uh, microseconds at most. We have a couple that are a little bit lower at this, you know, 13,000 mark, but they're almost all kind of in that 17,000, 13,000 range. See, in this case, you know, it's all in that 16,000, 13,000 range. And likewise here, 15, 13, 15 again, 13, right? They're all fairly close together. So we're more optimizing for, you know, making sure that no thread is waiting too long to get the lock. So we might end up sacrificing a little bit in, you know, overall execution time because we're not optimizing for throughput anymore. Uh, but we're making sure that our threads get a more equal chance to get access to, say, some critical section. We're, in, we're instituting some sort of fairness inside of our locking mechanism. Okay, so that's going to go ahead and for, 
and do it for this time. It's a simple example of fairness in the context of spin locks here with this ticket spin lock. If you want to learn more about things like uh, spin locks and ticket spin locks, like I said last time, I have an entire playlist that's on how you can actually implement these spin locks yourselves and different optimizations that you can make when implementing spin locks. But that's going to go ahead and do it for today. You can find any of these examples at github.com slash coffee before arch. Uh, but as always, I hope you have a nice day.